Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Oh, okay. Um, so she. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so following sort of the PBJ today, I'm just going to focus a little bit more um, around green participatory budgeting and Scotland's um, commitment to climate change. So we we'll just go on to the next slide. Um, so in 2019, it was uh, this was quite a key year for Scotland and many many other nations in the world in the sense that Scotland declared itself in a climate emergency, um, and what that meant. Was was that local, regional and national partners um, came together to essentially work on how we can achieve um, a net zero Scotland. Um, and specifically for Scotland, there was political commitment to ensure that we reduce um, carbon emissions by 75% by 20, I think it's 2030. So fairly ambitious targets, but um, I think what's interesting about Scotland uh, along with other um, nations is that we want to ensure that the process to get into a just transition to net zero is fair and is a just process for everyone, ensuring that no one's left behind um, in terms of shifting away from those carbon intensive um, industries. Um, I think I've kind of added the slide around community empowerment because I think it gives real leverage to, to what's happening in the community empowerment world um, in the sense that participatory budgeting along with other participatory democracy methods can um, kind of work towards a fairer and greener um, and a just sort of process. So this was a quote uh, we extracted from the recent COP, um, COP26 conference from our First Minister, um, who essentially gives agency to, to listening to people's voices, um, and that is um, essentially critical in ensuring that a process is fair. Um, so uh, yeah, I mentioned a little bit about COP26, um, and of course many of you know um, COP26 was hosted in Glasgow, so not too far from here, and yet Scotland was really proud to have hosted this um, Global Climate Summit, um, and it was really great to see as well that participatory budgeting, um, as well as other community empowerment policies, was sort of given a global stage in exploring kind of the roles of communities in a just transition. Um, so here you'll see many of um, people here today, but also people here online, uh, a panel of experts um, coming together to, to start this discussion. So. I feel like COP26, along with just the year of 2021, was quite a pivotal um, moment for embedding green um, into the PB agenda. So again, many, many lessons have been learned from COP26, but I think I extract this key quote from our uh, Minister for Public Finance, Planning and Community Work, uh, Mr. Tom Arthur, who um, again, share same, uh, similar sentiments to, to the previous quote from our First Minister, but essentially saying that given the opportunities, uh, local, um, local communities can develop effective solutions to address uh, local needs as well. So um, I mentioned a little bit about um, kind of the lessons from COP26, and again, using 2021 as almost that pivotal year for Green PB, um, this is our document here, our programme for government, and what this essentially is is a, is a mission statement or a document that sets out um, clear actions for Scotland to achieve a fairer and greener Scotland. So um, there are three key things that we kind of took out from the programme for government where Green PB was embedded in the agenda, um, you know, looking to explore how we can engage young people and children more in climate conversations, um, as well as working as well um, closely with councils to, to achieve that as well. So that's programme for government. Um, I'm not sure about time, but I'm just going to, you yeah, know, that's fine. I'm just going to quickly run through one key example that um, well, yeah, just a really big achievement for this year in terms of our Just Transition Fund. So, but I won't talk about it in too much detail because I know that um, partners here are here to talk about that as well. But essentially earlier in May this year, our Minister for um, Just Transition, Employment and Fair Work announced a 10 year uh, 500 million pound um, capital fund targeted in the Northeast. Um, and the reason why we're targeting the Northeast for this year is because of the historical context of the fact that it's a very carbon intensive industry relying a lot on, on oil and gas. Um, and so hopefully we're going to shift, we're working together to help shift the economy away from that carbon intensive industry towards more fairer and greener um, jobs. So what's really exciting about this year um, is an example of mainstreaming PB into existing funds. And so 
with the, with the 20 million pounds that was made available this year, 1 million pounds will be ring fenced for um, participatory budgeting. Um, so ensuring that local people in Aberdeen City, Aberdeenshire and Murray have a direct say on how um, that 1 million pounds capital fund will be spent. So again, I've just um, mentioned this quote from our minister again, ensuring that no one is left behind in this journey towards a just transition. Uh, how am I on time? <laughs> just you're okay. Yeah, good. Um, I just included these snapshot logos of all of the, the our partners involved in this. And I think what's really key and really exciting about how we've done the fund this year is that we're ensuring a real collaborative approach, approach across partners so in, um, in the North East. So, of course, we've got um, partners from TSI Murray, Aberdeen Voluntary Action and the Aberdeen City uh, Voluntary Organisations, ACVA, um, who are sort of the delivery partners in managing the fund, as well as receiving um, essential and important support as well from our Money for Murray group and Nescan Hub, and of course, SCDC in terms of providing um, overall sort of expertise and knowledge in PV training and processes. So that's it for the Just Transition Fund. I'll just give a quick summary in terms of what um, essentially is what we'd want to capture from the perspective of the Scottish Government. Um, and essentially it's just to say that we do have um, a real legal commitment to um, tackling climate change in terms of reducing our contributions to uh, global um, carbon emissions by 2045. Um, and again, going back to the political commitment applied from ministers, local partners as well, um, communities do play an essential role um, in that journey to a net zero. Um, and in terms of why we're all here today, in terms of green participatory budgeting, it's just fantastic to see that this is one method, but we shouldn't forget that there are other tools, like I mentioned earlier in your presentation, um, that can help tackle and strengthen um, participatory democracy, as well as tackling the subsequent climate change um, agenda. So thank you very much. I think I say another word. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, just You've quickly. Got 32 seconds. <laughs> okay, what I wanted to share with you really is that it's worth um, being tenacious with PV because you do get a lot of challenges, you get a lot of doors closed in your face because it's so expensive. I've been working for years with our climate colleagues and sending them links and sending them um, um, evidence and, and sharing information with them and trying to get them to go to climate and PV workshops. And they rang me one day in May. Yes. Would you like a million pounds to do a PV in the northeast? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> And then we worked really quickly with everyone to make it happen. It was hard, no extra staff, no extra money for us. You guys were amazing. We made it happen. If it goes well, it could happen again for the next four years. So we're very excited about this. Thank you for the extra right. time. Thank you. That's great. You were absolutely on time. I'm so accustomed to academics with never on time that this is so refreshing. Um, just to say just a couple of things you might see that we are taking pictures at the moment i'm taking pictures of those here on the stage but it would be great to take pictures of the room at some point so if you don't want to be uh, on mastodon or twitter or any of these social media spaces let us know okay we can photoshop you out and or, or put elon musk's face on you or, <laughs> or something like that um okay uh, the, the other thing uh, is worth saying um i mean you know, I remember in 2010, just building on, on the story that, that uh, Kathleen was just sharing, I remember in 2010, in this very university, a very, very, very senior civil servant who um, was telling me, look, uh, participatory budgeting is not going to happen in Scotland. Citizens' assemblies are not going to happen. Digital crowdsourcing is not going to happen. And 12 years later, there has been massive progress. So the point that you're making about persevering and keeping that um, activism uh, and advocacy going is really important. And you mentioned the challenge that people tend to talk about. Um, you know, how expensive some of these processes can be. And we just need to, I think we need to shift the conversation and talk less about price and more about value. Because the climate emergency is a crisis that has been created by all kinds of top-down dynamics and the solutions surely are going to be bottom-up and, and communities need to be at the, dri the driving force. So it's value that really matters. And value is a ratio between what you invest and the purpose that you meet. And if that's right, then we can forget about price, about value, because it moves action forward. Um, 
And on that note, I am delighted to welcome Yves Caban, uh, who is a legendary in the PB field for many, many, many years. Uh, many of us were fans of Yves um, long ago before PB started in Scotland. And we have now the opportunity to hear from Yves um, how things are going across Europe, some examples of green PB, and your thinking uh, about this agenda. All right, so uh, good morning everybody, each one of you. It's a delight to be here, actually, you know, and listening to Kathleen and, and Tricia, I remember we were sitting side by side in Guadalajara, and I was amazed about, I mean, a government who could support PB, because so far you had only Argentina who was doing so, and they were doing very well. And if you want to understand the long, I mean, how long it has started, it, it has lasted, you know, in, in uh, all over. Argentina is a good example, and you were the other one. The second aspect, and, and Tricia, you, I mean, you insisted on that during your presentation. And I said, well, this is really the good country to work with. <laughs> because you, you, you brought to the scene the importance of policies, the political perspective, the macro framework that we usually in PB uh, don't consider too much. It's a very local affair, you know, limited. And you brought that in, and, and it was uh, truly exciting. It's true that uh, when you say 2015, uh, that you've been in, on that, uh, you know, I, I feel you're very young, you know, because I've been involved virtually since I migrated to Brazil in uh, after the dictatorship with the first workers' party uh, government. So it has been a long journey. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, we see if the technique works out. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's speak a little bit about this idea of a European caravan. You see, I give you a little bit of the origin, how it started, and why we are here, because that's one of the stories. As you can see, it's a caravan that uh, is going in four cities, plus a fifth one, which will be during the International Observatory for Local Democracy, which we, the annual conference this year is in uh, Grenoble, in, in France. And happily, after four sessions in four different languages, we are very keen on, and I'm very keen, especially on that, to have dialogues in different languages in order for citizens which have been involved, which are the, the, the engine of, of PB, to be able not to be talking a language they hardly know or through translators, and then you exclude. So one of the key reasons was to say, okay, let's have at least four languages. It's not all, but it's a symbolic sort of approach. And, uh, and it has worked uh, quite well so far, you know, to try to, to, to work in our own languages. You know. It facilitates communication. So that's quite an important aspect. <clears throat> Why are we here? Basically because, I mean, climate change is affecting our place and on the planet. But what I observe is that most of what is being done, you go to COP27, you know, in isolated places, you have bigger agendas, large recommendations from government, but very little is really dealing with how people are suffering in their neighborhood, as we're saying, left, leave no one behind. Are those left behind are actually, I mean, the ones suffering. So what I'm going to speak now is basically what is under the radar of international agencies of national commitments, you know, what's happening locally, you know, and I'm very pleased to be here with you when I listen to Dundee when I speak. This is the real world and climate change starts there. So this image is taken in Molina de Segura, big event, unexpected, close to Murcia. Um, and this is amazing because this is how it happens. You know? And this shouldn't be a vulnerable country in relation to international, but this is where it happens, not in the whole city, in one place. You know? Fortunately, and this is the whole story, we can have a positive look 
you know, when you look at how local governments and cities have been changing slowly to capture this climate emergency that we are facing, um, you will realize that there are plenty of initiatives. And this was the starting point. I was amazed I mean, traveling around cities in the world to see that things were moving. And moving for good, you know, with small, big, large, very unique innovation. So the whole point was, let's try to have evidence of what, of this is real, this is important, you know. And gathering this evidence was part of the exercise that probably has all of the effort. 15 cities documented on the free will, you know, to get an open source sort of document for everybody showing how, what they were doing, what were they from. But probably one of the threads of the caravan, if you want to look the rays you know, that unite them, to my opinion, this is the following, is to show that the deepening of participatory democracy mechanisms, and I totally agree with Kathleen, what uh, you were saying, uh, Tricia, that it's not a unique one. You have plenty of them, other instruments, and all together they set up a, a sort of participatory ecosystem, which is substantiating a new form of looking at politics. So the deepening of participatory democracy mechanisms, including PPs, are essential to address the dramatic effects of climate change, especially on the most vulnerable, with a dual perspective of social and climate justice. Uh, this is important to claim and to have the, I mean, the clarity to say, Democracy has not been able to face uh, the climate change effect. Look at the temperature. And, the, and this is basically promoted by representative democracy and the democratic world. It's not working. So either we understand that participatory democracy, more democracy is needed, or we won't just drive at high speed against the wall. So this is the race that you unite these little initiatives which are. Let's speak very briefly on the origins. So basically things were happening, made invisible, when at the same time agenda were moving. So <clears throat> with some colleagues, what I tried to do was identifying what was happening. And in Istapalapa in, in, in November 29, uh, I called them, I mean, the ones I knew, and to my surprise, they all came. And we have a fantastic sort of improvised event of 10 minutes each. And everybody was amazed. Oh, I'm not the only one. So you had people from New Taipei City listening to people from San Pedro Garcia Garcia in Mexico and from Luingia in the South Kivu, very violent work. And they started to say, hey, we are on the same page. Okay. And it was the first event session on contribution of PB with, uh, with that in mind, we said, okay, let's go move one step further to, to highlight agenda. And uh, in the World Urban Forum in Abu Dhabi, which is more a UN promoted stuff, we had a second session with new people coming in and UN started to say, hey, this is interesting. <clears throat> then said, okay, we are not visible, we need evidence, we need to document that. So the question was, okay, are you ready, each one of you, to document what you do? And I, mean, I, I might tell that this is the, the crucial role, you know, to compare that and put that into tables and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And this is where this book was, uh, was issued and you could gather some evidence that you do better with participatory budgeting than without it, with numbers, projects, which are not documented normally. Uh, okay, so the fourth, fourth, the fourth step was to have all the webinars, a webinar to show what was happening in the different languages, but to gather new people. And you can't imagine how this so far is a community of practice, which is, uh, really existing and um, th th that is growing. <clears throat> but let's go now. What are the key objectives of the caravan? First, sharing knowledge and good practices on 
clean climate participatory budgeting see each one of the cities which are practicing have their own words some are saying well it's an eco citizen okay other are saying sustainable development which involves money in it. others are saying climate uh, change and then, then said okay all this goes into the same direction with different speed different uh, alleys and avenues but let's have that as a gathering word and then green came like a holistic sort of flat and say in relation to some which are more so sharing your experience means that your experience count basically and what i observe on pd is that about only 10 percent of the experiences in the world if it's something between 6,000 to 10,000 experiences, which we can call PB, 10% uh, are documented. Most of it is volatile and disappear. There is no documentation. So please, the sharing of experiences to document, to have that highlighted, to show the project, to, it's part of that, you know. But it was also to reflect, highlighting lessons learned or obstacle solution, and your testimonies are crucial. <clears throat> that was part of it. But the other one is that we hope, and that's an invitation to, to all of you during this today, and addressing also the, the, the colleagues on, on, on online, is to formulate recommendations and to, have, to be very clear that we need to move the agenda. And we need commitment from, uh, well, in the case of, Scotland, you are relatively lucky to have a document which is supporting, you know, but in some countries it's not at all the same. So what can we do in our own government to move? You know, IOPD has been very open, but uh, in their general assembly, they are ready to listen, but they want to know from you uh, what should be, what can be done. So the recommendations are also for IOPD. We are very keen in having the European Union much more supportive sort of approach, you know, and that's why the first time we spoke, you know, you are part, maybe it's Brexit uh, country, but you are a European country, and this counts, and when we selected, you know, we identified the shortlist, you know, four or five, where we would have the, the image, and with my only I, IOPD colleagues, I said, look, they are part of Europe, and they are doing good, so we we need to have this Scottish vegan. I mean, going in, in that, and that was approved. And that's what also is so happy to be here. You know, I'm, I'm a professor in, in London. But, uh, you know, this, so very pleased to have you as part of the European vegan. We don't want to lose you, we want to learn from you. Okay, let's be clear on that. So, European Union, what's the point? And your views are important on that. Is what I hope, and we hope, a couple of people here, is to get a fund, a, a fund of 500 million, 1 billion, which is nothing in European uh, wasted uh, money many times, even on climate, to top up what you are doing. Each city puts one, European Union, you need to put two if you want to be serious in that view. So I had some conversation, and this is going, so the recommendations at the end, of this gathering of Europe is quite important to get this or more or less. And let's debate on that. And recommending guidelines and participatory budgeting you know, along what you were mentioning on uh, the type of cities are, I would say, two types. Those who are already well advanced and we, are, we want to learn from you. No, I heard about, I'm curious about Gandhi because I read actually things. So but they're learning from you documenting that, but it's also to think about all those cities which have a, a PD, but which is not too green, let's say, so far. So they are interested in greening the, 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 their PD. How can we do that? You know, is it worth it? What are your obstacles? So these are the two sort of, of cities. So if you are not practicing green PD, is this the place to think how to do it? Four cities, quite different, very quickly. Valongo, 100,000 inhabitants, large experience in uh, youth PV in schools with an incredible uh, result, amazing, which is they have been able to implement the same year in six months, all the projects we were about 
since I work on that, I've never seen such an efficiency, you know, on, on the hundred. It's a part of auto metropolitan area with the classical problems of periphery. So that's that's one framework. And this is where it started. Uh, Barcelona, you are shifting scale. Regional capital, they are more interested to exchange with large cities. So it's a sort of panel of quite different uh, situation. Uh, <clears throat> Edinburgh, unique enough for us because, and I read a uh, paper from, uh, from you, Oliver, and, and from the evaluation you did, that you, this is the first time I saw this sort of agreement that you were referring to between Kosla and the central government plus a set of partners. I thought that this sort of governance was one of the key lessons I learned from a couple of your papers. So this is uh, very interesting for the group. And then you have saint Grève, saint Grève, 18,000 inhabitants, part of the 1 million Grenoble aglo, and it raises something very important at night and we want answers from that, is what can you do when you are a very small uh, municipality? There is one lady full of energy with a classic top-down sort of local government with politicians which are there, you know, and men, and she's a lady doing her best. I mean, all this gender sort of situation. And what I observed is that there are hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of very small municipalities which are crucial for people. Why? Because these are the territories where land grabbing takes place, where mining takes place, because they have no power. And if the central governments want to put in those small cities, I mean, an extractive industry which is going to pollute all the water and increase the, the, the climate, uh, they can't do anything. So I think that is a global challenge on that, on having PB in small communities. Yeah. You were right, you know. Just to give you the last five minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Grenoble is quite important, not only because it's the end of the caravan, it will be multilingual, you are mostly invited, you want to, to, to listen, but we'll have three big sessions in Grenoble, one on youth PB and what they can do, Another one, which is a panel of invited people from all over the place. So it's, it, it's plus the launching of a couple of books. So if those interested in, it's not, not too far. It's a Pascal as Scotland. Don't worry, you are on the Alps. Yeah. You won't have any, any problem. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Little word on what has been being built and inspired by you, I must say too. Eh? It was to build a sort of multi-level, multi-partners. Um, governance of all that story, you know, because we think that it's something which cannot be solved only by one actor. And it has been quite successful so far, you know, international, national, local authorities, you have that in, in the presentation. We are still missing much the communities, representative of local association of the people, but uh, that, that's a challenge. Um, <clears throat> I can keep that, uh, Oliver. Uh, I can keep that. What we have learned so far for uh, the um, for the next session. You still, you, said you have four minutes. Four minutes, maybe. Oh, tell us a little bit. It's good, it's good to remind ourselves, you yeah. know, how, how how urgent and how how many facets there are to, to yeah. what we're trying to do. See, as I was telling you, we're missing evidence. So my observation after examining 4,400 projects, you know, from all these places, it has been a tremendous job, you know, to see which one were related to, to climate, you know, and we did that as a collaborative effort. My main conclusion was, these are solutions which are out of the box. And this is quite serious. Central government with all their laws and IPCC and, and all that, they are not creative enough to understand the problems and the solution, and the solution brought by people, and how efficient and, and, and they are. See, I take a, a, a city which I admire a lot, which is Agueda in, in Portugal, which are suffering as many cities which are part of the study of multiple dramatic effects of climate change. Usually it's not one, unfortunately, you are in plenty, heat waves and floods, etc. Okay. So they have floods and wildfires. And one of the projects was the construction of a mega water tank 
50,000 euros just to fix our debts to enable local associations to better fight devastating fires. Was not existing? And fires, wildfires were devastating. Interesting thing, too, is that the location of that water tank is not haphazard. It's also with people. Let's move to Russia. I had the pleasure to work there before the war. And um, they have been setting up in, in, in all these uh, <coughs> core large fields, you know, Caucasus, which is the continuity of Ukraine, actually, you know, our granary outside. And you have in small places like uh, Asgir and Stravopol, Krai, uh, 5,000, 5,000 fires a year in the ex cold calls and soft calls. Okay. I said, but who is putting the fires? You know, like in France, you have also, always somebody <laughs> behind all these crimes. You yeah. said, no, it's because of our soil, because of the heat that the, the stones themselves are sp spreading with fire. And this ends up with our production. So what they did, and they say, if you don't catch in 20 minutes the fire, you are done. It spreads. And no stations were existing. So through the request from people, people said, okay, let's use these old Soviet times sort of uh, facilities to transform them in fire station and buying uh, just a, a something. And they've been able to burn 500 of that, of these facilities per year in Russia. Okay. So obviously people supported that. New forms of financing, you know, the money, the 1 million that we're speaking about became 3 million because the, the, the peasants, I mean, the, they were interested, you know, to have their, their crop. So you, you can see the importance of that associated with early warning solution plus um, the same solution as we saw in Agda at, an, at another scale. So this is very impressive. And the millions saved economically for this region, not for the plutocrats from, uh, you know, from, from Russia, no, for the people. Those left behind by the model. It's amazing. And I finalized just with um, one, another one, which is, you know, in, in front of the big ideas, I'm in Indonesia here, 17,000 17, islands. And the rise of the sea plus the tsunami are just devastating for people. You are right on the water. So this sort of solution, which is very much people-based, which is not entering agenda with people, we chose that PV is also a sort of catalyst, I mean, it has a catalyst, catalytic uh, value. When people are interested, it was in Russia, it's here, they tend to contribute and multiply your investment by two or three. Usually we've been working on that and it's quite a bit interesting. I end up here with this one, which is, in which types, and that this has been really a finding because I, we didn't know when we started, in which types of PB are climate and green, green PBs in Russia? What is the situation? And we observe the, the following. Most cases are space-based, the whole city, the whole region, where you have the possibility to propose and have green projects soft mobility, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. This is still the dominant. But what are the new tendencies which I identify? You have, like Metz, Bordeaux, but I could cite a couple of more, which are thematic people. 100% of the money goes exclusively for uh, sustainable development, for, uh, for um, climate related issues, you know. So they decided to shift and have PV, especially to, to have a green touch, 100%. And this is new and it's emerging. But you have a couple of others interesting stuff, like a mix between actors PV, you know, for a specific group where you put money for the elderly or for the most vulnerable, homeless, name them migrants. And, uh, here, 
here are the actors and the topics. You know, here you have Molina de Segura that decided to have a youth PD for climate as an instrument to raise awareness for the youth, for the kids. So it's not so much the money, you know, but it's more for, for that. And um, another one is quite interesting in New Taipei City. I mean, the big city, uh, actually, uh, in Taipei, for me, in Taipei, is PVs for energy saving exclusively and with the private sector and actors, which was not mobilized, but they decided to work on that on sort of projects. So this is also another sort of place if you want to hook your PD somewhere. This is something that we might want to uh, think about. I'd continue on, uh, I mean, tomorrow. Or yeah, tomorrow still. we have the uh, rest of the day and tomorrow. So. Yeah, yeah. Go. So very pleased to be here again. Thank you. And uh, well, we're going to discuss great. <laughs> OK, and now uh, we are, thanks for that. Um, we will, the discussion will follow after the presentations. We're going to move now to Naomi Clark, who's here from Dundee City Council. And Dundee has been one of the pioneering cities in Scotland when it comes to PV. So we're really pleased to, to hear what you're doing around mainstreaming green PV. It's always good to start with a thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi everyone, uh, I'm Linda Clark, uh, I work with the City Council's Sustainability and Climate Change team. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the Dundee Climate Fund and particularly the practicalities around the fund, uh, which is Scotland's first green participatory budgetary project. Um, my colleagues Viola Marks and Brian Harris actually led on this project, but they couldn't be here today, so excuse me for our notes. So uh, Dundee's um, already got lots and lots of groups taking part in um, climate change activities across the city and we have Transition Dundee with a community fridge and a community wardrobe. We have the new Dundee Cycle Hub um, and we have the Dundee Climate Action Network to name a few. Um, but there's also lots of groups that require a lot more support um, to participate in climate action in Dundee. Um, we see the fund as a really important part um, of the council's policy response um, and to mobilise community climate action. Um, firstly, where there's no action at all. Um, secondly, to enable groups to increase their, their impact. Um, and thirdly, um, facilitating capacity building um, up within the network of local stakeholders. Uh, so Dundee City Council will be the first local authority in Scotland to use a green participatory budgeting model and have citizens decide on the local climate change spend. Um, through a democratic process, uh, the citizens of Dundee um, will, be will decide who will be awarded the funding um, and how to spend part of a public budget which supports the delivery of the Dundee Climate Action Plan, which was actually launched in, in 2019. The fund is going to run over a four year period um, during which £750,000 will be made available um, to deliver community led climate change projects. Um, during which, um, in the city, where £250,000 is revenue funding and £500,000 is capital funding. Um, and we're going to consider applications from small projects, um, and that runs a minimum of £6,000 to a maximum of £25,000. Um, and large projects up to a maximum of £100,000. Um, and then for proposals over £25,000, organisations with pre reserves in excess of three months um, operating expenses will require to provide match funding um, of 25% in counter cash. And only done deconstituted groups can apply, so no individuals or sole traders, for example. And we're also not funding any projects uh, that other Scottish government grants cover, for example, um, cycle paths that are funded by Sustrand. Um, and I guess what's important um, in Dundee 
is that um, it provides an opportunity to, to raise awareness of climate change locally um, and support communities to identify and develop their own projects um, uh, with the support from the uh, Council's community services and the sustainability and climate change team. Um, the fund's going to run twice, so the budget is divided um, in half. Um, and that will allow community groups that already have off-the-shelf projects to go ahead quickly, uh, but also gives um, enough time to inspire and work up proposals from groups which previously have not engaged in climate change, um, or even get people together to become um, a constituted group. So the fund um, focuses on the four topics from the Dundee Climate Action Plan, which includes um, energy, transport, waste and climate resilience. Um, additionally, um, a fifth topic was added for the purpose of the fund, uh, which is building capacity or raising awareness. Um, and the purpose of this topic is to allow groups to create projects which engage communities and young people in climate change um, through events and local campaigns, for example. Um, and instead of just focusing on um, carbon uh, dioxide emissions, um, which is what other community climate change funds have focused on before and sometimes a barrier to participation, um, we want to raise carbon awareness uh, within communities uh, to capture ideas and really um, empower different sectors, um, especially those groups that are not currently involved in climate action. And this way we can um, follow up on the previously generated enthusiasm from COP26, where we ran a really successful six-week engagement programme in Dundee, um, and then we can work on the next steps. So um, another element of this project is that we want to capture local voices and ideas. And so through the creation of an ideas bank by the online portal console, uh, we'll develop a platform that allows members of the public to share their ideas they have for their community. Um, and these captured ideas can then form the basis for future projects um, for the second round of funding. Um, and the Ideas Bank also acts as a space to discuss these ideas publicly, which has the potential to connect residents to, to local groups and get a little bit more involved. The, the Dundee Climate Fund um, officially launched at the start of Scottish Climate Week, where we also launched our new Sustainable Dundee webpage and the Sustainable Dundee map. Um, and that's a new tool that links the UN Sustainable Development Goals to local projects to try and provide the local context to, to the goals. Um, and we also use um, our various social, social media networks. Uh, the launch took place at Dragon Academy with Councillor Alexander, who's the leader of Dundee City Council, um, and head teacher, um, and a teacher that moves on the skills through growing and skills training. So the submission deadline for applications is Monday, 20th of November. Um, these will be reviewed by the 16th of December and the final costings by the 15th of January. Um, vote will take place from the 1st, to the 1st of February to the 25th of March um, and winners announced at the beginning of April. The applications will undergo an internal review process to check the feasibility and the eligibility criteria. Our review panel is made up of internal officers and external partners, for example, Zero Waste Scotland and Home Energy Scotland. Um, and the projects meeting the criteria will then be shared online for the public to vote on. Um, submissions and voting will happen through COSLA's online platform console, uh, which was rebranded to Dundee's Voice, um, and it has a dedicated email address. Um, and once it's time, the Dundee citizens will cast their vote to determine which projects the funder will be awarded um, to through a shopping basket procedure. And the successful applicants will be required to submit monitoring reports to the governance group every six months um, and a case, case study highlighting project success at the end of delivery. Um, and the governance group is made up of the sustainability and climate change team, legal, finance and community services. So now we'll just wait for all our submissions to come in and we're just really looking forward to seeing what ideas our community has. Thank you. That's brilliant. And also uh, really nice that you didn't even use all the time, <laughs> which again, that doesn't happen in this place very often. It doesn't happen. <laughs> Um, let's get one shot for those uh, online. Uh, we already got a question 
that we're going to put to uh, to the speakers later. Uh, but there's one more presentation. So this is just to let those online know that we are collating the questions. If you got any more, please um, just post them in the chat. Um, now, the final presentation, um, we have a dream team coming from the Northeast. So we got B. Dawkins, Alistair Kennedy, Fabio Villani, and Nicola Twine. And they are going to share with us the kind of uh, thinking and work that they're doing around uh, this exciting Just Transition Green PV funding. So, floor is yours. <laughs> My name is Nicola Twine. I work for NESCAN, which is or the NESCAN hub, I should say, which is Northeast Scotland Climate Action Network. And um, the hub is the kind of resource employed team behind the scenes that has been on the go for about a year now. Um, these are our partners, they'll all introduce themselves in just a second, uh, but I'd just like to say I'm the newest one to this team, so I very foolishly, in that newbie kind of enthusiasm, said, I'll put together the presentation. <laughs> Think it would be a great learning opportunity, which it has. <laughs> but um, I've got these guys here because I don't want to do all the talking. It's more interesting if you hear it than more than just from me. So I will <laughs> move it on. So we're here today to talk about our partnership, um, Green PB project, which comes from the Scottish Government Just Transition Fund, which you heard about earlier. So I'm not going to go back over all the ins and outs of that, but um, it's been a, a great opportunity really for us to kind of run with and develop this. But what we're going to talk about today is our journey and our story as a partnership delivering this, because while Green PB is new in Scotland, also, as far as we're aware, there has not been a partnership approach to delivering it before. Um, and so that has come with some great opportunities and learning and also some challenges. Um, so we're just gonna kind of chat through that today uh, and yeah, our story of where we are now with it, what's coming next, and then the kind of learning and future recommendations. So we will have a wee, chat with the key partners that make up the project. Um, I will just say that we've only kind of been in partnership on this since about July, August time. <laughs> and all the money in this first round has to be spent by the end of March. So there's our biggest challenge just there is the whole timeline of this. Um, but there's been some kind of great um, experiences and different partnership skills and expertise that's been brought together. So we're doing our very best, aren't we, to kind of work and get this money out into the community so that they can make a difference. So, um, B, do you want to say <laughs> hello where you're from? Yeah, I'm B. I work for ACWO and we're the third sector interface in Aberdeen City. I feel we're a bit scabby made of the partnership because we don't have any experience delivering participatory budgeting or indeed any eco-friendly project. We just generally work to support all non-profit organisations in Aberdeen City and champion our sector. Although we have delivered some funding in the past through more traditional funding models, uh, we're not really set up to deliver funding. We're a very, very small team. So this has been a tremendous learning opportunity for us in so many ways. And we're really thankful for the opportunity to be able to share our learning with you all today. So that's us. Alison? Hi, everybody. I'm Alistair Kennedy. Cut a long story short, I set up a PB group way back in, I think it was 2016. To date, we've delivered six or seven PB exercises, and I think we've dispersed something like close to half a million pounds. We were approached by uh, Kathleen this time round to see if we would support these guys, because we probably had the most experience in PB, which we were... <laughs> Happy to do with reservations because we never worked in partnership before and we knew that we'd slow the process down. Uh, but however, we are here and we're learning and it's, it's, it's been a challenge. But it's, as I said, the first time we've worked in partnership and we're sort of feeling our way as we go, but enjoying it. So we're ever hopeful that this will continue, this partnership. Yeah, I'm Fabio from TSI Mari. I'm one of Alistair's partners. We actually have worked in partnership before. 
Uh, I work for TSI Mari uh, with the Puerto Lobo staff supporting uh, grassroots community initiatives at their sector organizations. Uh, we also are the only um, third sector organization in Scotland to actually run the leader program supporting the local action group um, that was in fact chaired and still chaired by Alistair. So while we haven't worked in partnership or TV um, in the past, we both have experience with PB. We took PB to Mari in 2015 as an organization and been running programs most years. Currently running a pilot program for PB Lottery, who is looking at the national level, is looking at how best to involve communities in decision making about the funding they distribute. And they are a substantial funder of community activity in Scotland. And they, yeah, we've enjoyed the journey so far. And yeah, collaboration is the name of the game. We um, describe ourselves uh, as connecting people, creating change. So uh, we try to live by our slogan. Brilliant. Okay, and um, our other delivery partner who can't be here today is Ava, which is Aberdeenshire Voluntary Action. So they're the Aberdeenshire um, TSI, and their mission is to promote um, the growth of strong, resilient communities by connecting, supporting and promoting the third sector in Aberdeenshire. And they bring to this story some previous experience with um, participatory budgeting up in the north of Aberdeenshire in partnership with the Health and Social Care Partnership. Um, targeted at the more deprived communities around the kind of feature head of Fraserburgh area. I think there was two rounds of that about four or five years ago. So the first one was um, in-person face-to-face voting at events, and the second one was online. Um, kind of they're a, a wee bit sceptical about how well that went down, but there was a lot of learning from it. But the, the, what they kind of took from it in terms of the public's involvement and engagement was that um, the bigger and more better known communities and projects uh, got more of the, the, the money and funding, regardless of whether um, the projects were well conceived or they were going to have a, a good impact. And um, <clears throat> the ones that were slick with their marketing as well um, obviously attracted folk in. So there was maybe some other opportunities there that missed out. And that's been quite an interesting point because I would say that um, we've, we're bearing that in mind in terms of the community development and the capacity building. Um, especially when it comes to then the voting stage to get the reach out there and get, you know, the wider communities and networks um, involved in that. And um, just a wee bit about Nescam, which I did just touch on. So we're a very young organisation. We're a community interest company. Um, it's developed a couple of years ago, um, but Nescan Hub as an organisation um, has is just passed a year old. We're fully funded by the Scottish Government. Um, because there's an intention there as far as I believe that they would like um, regional um, climate action network hubs around Scotland and so Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen City in the North East is a good place to start um, given the just transition work and everything that's going on there. There's also another one across in the Highlands and Islands and um, as um, TFI Murray were saying um, in Murray they're kind of like overseeing that as part of your kind of agenda as well isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I guess, why are we involved as the partners? Well, in Aberdeen City, um, ACWO and NESCAM are partnering in terms of uh, administrating and releasing the funds, taking in the applications, um, and also animating it, getting the public involved in that capacity building and discussions with people. And then in Aberdeenshire, it's Ava and Nescan doing the same there. And in Murray, it is TSI Murray and Money for Murray doing that job. Um, community groups and non-for-profit organisations can apply and they can apply for anything up to £50,000, but only one application per group. So it doesn't matter if they've got several projects, just the one application. Yeah. Okay. So the kind of things that are covered, um, I'm not completely sure if if this continues, hopefully as it will over the next four years. At the moment it's capital only. Um, I'm not sure if that will be the case over the next four years, but it absolutely is just now. So no staff or running costs. Um, it can cover things like um, improving equipment, land and buildings. And some examples of that could be insulating your community building, energy saving devices, retrofitting, um, bikes and repair stations, um, transport, electric charging points for communities, etc. And um, I think quite popular this year has been a lot of community garden initiatives. So the, the biodiversity bit has been quite popular 
I think again, possibly because of the time scale, in terms of that's maybe uh, less complicated to put the bids together for those things, and maybe several communities have been thinking about that for a while. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> where are we at just now in terms of uh, our journey? <clears throat> it has not been a perfect participatory budgeting process, um, but we've given it a jolly good go. And um, I think while probably all the partners were a wee bit nervous, again, because of the time scales in place, it was an opportunity that we couldn't pass up and um, brilliant to really get started with that in the northeast of Scotland. So I think uh, I'd be correct in saying we're taking this very much as a sort of pilot baseline learning opportunity. We know it's not going to be perfect, but we are keenly watching and learning from it and we will improve as the, the years go on. Um, but you'll hear about um, the applications that are coming already. So, so far, um, it seems to be uh, going quite well in terms of our engagement. Um, <clears throat> So we've spoken about who's doing what. Um, obviously, the Scottish Government um, is our key partner and complete funder, um, but the Scottish Community Development Centre has been just amazing in terms of holding our hand through this process um, and connecting us with kind of different people, different tools, different ideas, and making sure that um, our mechanisms are fit for purpose, basically. Um, we have been so far, we've been creating the information, marketing and promotion together, um, engaging communities in the animation process, um, designing the application forms and launching and opening them, um, providing application support, further engagement to interested groups and projects. And um, we've just reached the close of our first application round. So I'll just tell you about that now. Um, so in this, we've reached up until the kind of developing and submitting proposal and application, um, and um, then we'll be coming on to the voting bit. So, applications closed on Monday. It'll be quite exciting. We've been, we've been petrified because we're kind of thinking, what happens if there's not enough applications in? We've got um, £333,000 um, to hand out um, and um, increase community capacity to do some wonderful stuff. But if we've not done a good enough job, they're not going to come in. And what happens if we don't get to that three hundred thirty-three thousand pounds? What happens to the process then? So I will tell you what has happened. <laughs> <laughs> so Aberdeen City, we're, we've, although we're all in the northeast of Scotland, we're quite different geographies and demographies. So that's important to bear in mind as well. And there's some quite good learning from that. So Aberdeen City covers 70 square mile. It's got a population of 227,000 and a density of 1,164 per kilometre square. They have received 39 funding applications yeah. and those funding applications total to uh, 1 million and 57,131 1, pounds. So well done to be over that. <laughs> Um, that's what's come in there. Um, Aberdeenshire, um, by contrast, is a large rural area, predominantly uh, 2,439 square miles, a population of 261,000, uh, a density of 36 per kilometre square. So quite different. And they have received 54 plus. It was 54 when I checked yesterday, but when I've checked today, they've said it's 55. So they've received 55 funding applications. And that totals at, again, over the £1 million mark. It's brilliant. And then we've got Murray, who um, is the little baby sibling. <laughs> that is small. <laughs> well, they're punching, they're punching. But in terms of like their population um, uh, and you know, that, they're, but they've got great ambitions and great experience. So um, they're, um, that's them there. And they have attracted in 34 funding applications and again totaling at nearly a million pounds. So well done. <laughs> okay, so um, the next leg of the journey um, is we need to move and turn our attention to um, the animation and engagement for the voting process. And <clears throat> we feel like we're constantly running behind time all the time. We, we can't ever be prepared enough for the next stages because we kind of started um, really late into this process. So we're kind of just all hands on deck to do that now, to get um, information out to school catchment areas, 
to community councils, other community groups, trying to engage, as I said, the wider public and communities rather than just those that have been involved with submitting the applications. Um, <clears throat> so does anyone want to speak a bit about the voting process online? Because I have not been part of that, that bit, that's more of being with the TSIs. I, I'm quite happy to say that we're in the process of looking at that as a partnership, but I think I wanted to reflect maybe on a couple of things first. Yes, of course. Uh, first of all, the animation part. Um, yes, the, the big worry when, when we were awarded the funds initially uh, was, can we get enough applications in uh, and, and enough value to make it a worthwhile participatory budgeting uh, process? And, and some of the things we've done with our uh, colleagues and partners in Murray has been a, an outreach program of funding roadshows. We had a, a few funding strands, but we're really keen on promoting the, the PP. And we've gone to parts of Murray um, which aren't often um, involved directly uh, in, in some of the, these activities. And in fact, um, including Comintao, which um, Murray is shaped like a triangle, is actually quite a large um, area. Yeah, by, by um, although dwarfed by a Patincha, it's quite large um, local authority <laughs> area by Scottish standards, with the sixth largest, although the population is very small. Coming Town is at the, the, the southernmost point of that triangle, and, the, and we were thanked for actually being there. We were there for a few hours, uh, both us and Money for Money, and told um, we got quite a lot of brownie points because uh, people don't often ask. To go to Tommy Tao. They usually go there dragged, kicking and screaming. Uh, but we actually wanted to be there. And we've had uh, applications from very small grassroots uh, community groups, and that, and that was brilliant. And the other thing I would like to reflect on is a kind of partnership journey. Um, you know, there was certainly a degree of nervousness uh, because the time scales were so tight. Um, but in the longer term, um, you know, the African proverb I'm told says, if you want to go fast, you walk alone. If you want to go far, you walk with others. So we're working, working together. We work pretty fast, actually. Uh, and we also tend to go far. So the voting is, a, is the next challenge. We, we do have um, some thoughts on how to use the on online voting platform that can actually collect the results for us at the same time and feed into the insight and what the communities are trying to do and what is it that they are. Uh, prioritizing. I think that's, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Well, we, up until the last exercise, we had never used a virtual online voting. Uh, we'd all, it always just handed people voting slips at each exercise. The last, the previous exercise, we ended up with some 350 people in the hall. Each person had to vote for 10 different applications. So that took quite a lot of counting. However, this time, because of COVID, we ended up having to use a uh, virtual platform. And it was amazing. And we had, I forget how many thousand votes, many, many more votes than we had previously. So that's kind of, I think, persuaded us to go that way. Although we will, st we will still have a uh, paper votes if any really required one. But I think uh, this, this is the, the way to go now. So it's been, it's been amazing, isn't it? <laughs> See, anything about the process so far or what's coming? Yeah, it's been a tremendous learning opportunity. And as we're such a small organisation in Aberdeen City, it's really been tremendously amazing to work with uh, such experienced partners uh, to support the entire process. And I'm just really impressed with all the partnership working we've been doing. And I think we also need to give a credit to Ava as well, although they can't be here today. And um, they have really done tremendously well in supporting us and supporting NESCAM in getting the fund launched. They have some great technical expertise there that have really helped us. Um, yeah, and in terms of the voting, um, because the fund only closed for applications Monday at midnight, that's less than 48 hours ago, uh, we are yet to thoroughly finalise what we're doing. But as my colleagues say, we're looking for most of it to be online with offline opportunities for voting. 
Um, we're thinking because we've had so many applications in, people will probably have to pick 10 organizations to vote for. I think five was probably too restrictive, but we need a conversation about that, not in front of people. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're looking to make it as simple and as streamlined as possible. During the application process, people were asked to provide a 150 word description, not for our benefit, but for the benefit of public vote. Um, and some, sorry, um, some organizations were really good at um, making that description really exciting. We need your vote for our project. And so all these uh, short descriptions will be available on our website and Case Myron's website and Ava's website. Uh, next time you might have them on yours as well. Um, and so people will be able to read these little descriptions of all the projects for the various uh, local authority areas. And then at the bottom, very short and sweet application form, not an application form, voting form, um, where we'll ask for your postcode just to make sure that if you're in Aberdeen City, you're voting for Aberdeen City projects. And then you'll be asked to select the 10 projects that you'd like to vote for. And these are all equally weighted to try and avoid any kind of favoritism or bias. Obviously, it's not a perfect system, um, but it's the best we could do. Yeah, we didn't want to wait the first time around because we wanted to kind of watch and learn and see what was happening for us. But I think the spread voting is the best way to try and make it fair. Is Absolutely. I might just add that the money for money is a completely voluntary just for your information. Yeah. We do because we're all doing it. Wow. <laughs> um, okay, so what next is that the voting will go live, then um, we will have the task of um, allotting the most popular ones to the funds and then informing them results, press, publicity. I would kind of say in this sort of uh, a very, very significant byproduct outcome of that, this has been that um, it's uh, raised the profile and awareness of um, climate action and all the rest of it. So it's been just such an important engagement tool. Um, so we kind of hope that there'll be many other outcomes from this as well. We're really keen to see what the projects do with this money. Um, we will be engaging with the losers and the winners. We can't call them losers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the runners up and the winners. And um, Nescan is in a position that we have got um, a seed funding pot. So we can support organisations with like 500 to 1,000 pounds in terms of startup and developing ideas and all the rest of it. So we'll kind of go with that olive branch and see if, if, if they would like to apply for that. Um, we'll release the money, then we want to monitor the outputs and outcomes and then start thinking more quickly. <laughs> about the next round so that we can kind of put in place all this learning and be more prepared and have a better time frame to work with. One thing I, I, I would say in our experience, anybody who, who didn't actually get funded, they never really had any complaints. I think okay. they, they realised it's a really democratic yeah. process, so there will never be any complaints, which is good. Well. Aye, because they've not got some official person to come to and vote yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so to, to sum up our learning then, um, Time and timing have been the biggest challenge. We've really spoken about that. Um, we more on our side, hopefully, next time. Um, <clears throat> because of the time and timeline, um, I think we could have been stronger on our partnership agreement from the get go um, in terms of just, just exactly who's doing what, how we're doing it all, and you know, really getting that foundation right. However, we find our way, we're finding our way, but I think we need to make that stronger for the next round. Um, also, Working in partnership, uh, everyone's been so busy. Sometimes the communication can be an issue. You don't always get the answers back or the responses when you want to. Um, so that has been a bit of an issue. And sometimes also the clarity of message. Um, you know, we've all been learning and figuring out what it means, what we need to be saying to the public, exactly what the parameters of it are. Um, so we, we need to get a bit slicker at that. But I think we've done a good job, but this is the learning. So um, the fact that it is something new. We've never actually done Green PD in partnership before, although we have a lot of experience in different parts of, of this. So um, yeah, just brand new. So that's a learning and a challenge and an opportunity has been great. Um, partner capacities and restrictions. Um, so we got given this money and this opportunity, but didn't necessarily have immediately in place the staffing to kind of start getting going with it. So that's obviously been a process but it's been a great opportunity as well because we've been able to actually increase our capacity. And um, so promotion, 
Um, in future rounds, we would like to do more illustration and case studies to help the public understand really what um, kind of our valid climate action projects um, and all the rest of it. So I think um, Dundee had some great examples about that. So it's good to kind of learn from other um, authorities and places and what they're doing. So we want to make that all stronger and um, engagements as well. We have done both online and in person, but we need to do a bit of checking up on the, the sort of returns of that, which leads me into uh, the final one is to sort out and be stronger with our targets, our KPIs and our monitoring, evaluation and learning. So we've just been kind of doing it all as we go along, but let's get it all kind of set in place at the outset so that it can kind of be strong, robust and we can evidence it all well. Um, so finally, um, <coughs> These are our kind of recommendations and considerations uh, moving forward. So we'll use this experience as a baseline um, that will strengthen our common understanding among partners, um, be smarter about our public engagement in terms of informing and reassuring them. People have got different experiences of participatory budgeting and might have a certain fixed idea about it. So we kind of need to work on that as well. Um, using mixed engagement methods and uh, increasing advertising and starting as early as possible. Um, lead and clarity among partners. Um, we've been very collaborative and equal footed. <laughs> However, sometimes I think um, it could do with someone taking an agreed lead and uh, coordination just so that uh, things can happen as and when they need to. Um, the application process needs to be a little bit clearer and the same as much as possible um, across the areas. Uh, the voting process needs to be forefront and uh, spoken about maybe a lot earlier so that people are animated about that and as I said the mail so that that's us great I don't know if anyone wants to say anything else what's part of learning is that they think let's learn not to volunteer to do it that's great that was brilliant it's, it's quite impressive what you've managed to do in just a few months. I mean, I remember when this was just an idea in the summer, oh. and we were thinking, can this happen in this time frame? But then that's what that's what they do in the northeast. Yeah. If anyone was going to be able to do it, it was, it was going to be the northeast. Um, we got a couple of uh, minutes to to try and take in some of the questions from uh, some of the participants online. Uh, so let me just check in with Francesca. Any more? Oh, you got beautiful writing, which works for me. Um, yeah, so there was a, a question that came early on, and I think this is a question for Kathleen and, and Tricia, perhaps, uh, or that's my interpretation because it came in very early on, right after your presentation. Um, so one well, of the participants online is asking, is there additional financial support available to local authorities for resources to deliver this locally? And I'm not sure if it means as part of the just transition fund or any other support. So I'll let you interpret that. Yeah, please yeah. come over here so that they can see it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. I mean, when we started the PV journey, um, we worked directly with local authorities. Uh, we, we started out with providing 14 local authorities with funding, training, and development, and match funding to do PV just to. Um, Test, test how people he would work in their community. Uh, but then we, we, what we did was we started working with Kosla instead, and that's how the the, the team in, in Kosla uh, was uh, established uh, with the PV program manager, and we have John who's the council um, uh, lead, and we had a training and development manager, and we had an inclusive manager. So the funding went to Kosla, and Kosla was supporting local authorities. Um, and that's the approach we've taken. So the quick answer is no, there's no, no direct funding to local authorities to, to do PB, but to local authorities do community engaged environment, community engagement, democracy like the rest of us. Um, and I'm sure that their leaders will fund and support that area of work in the same way that they support other public parts. Thank you. Um, uh, if, if the person who asked this online wants to come back, there is there, there are a couple of minutes to do that. It's worth noting that a lot of local authorities across Scotland are doing PB, and that's because of all the early activity that happened um, 
uh, since 2014 onwards, and many of them have continued. But we always knew there were going to be different speeds of development because each local authority has its own priorities, and uh, and we know how important political leadership is on all of this. And if you're not given the space, then that, that can be a struggle, which connects to the next question coming from Zoom. Um, so a colleague there is saying, I work for a small Scottish local authority and our climate change team is only two people. Um, so I think uh, this is um, reflecting on the Dundee uh, presentation. Dundee's approach sounds great and I would love to replicate, but I'm interested to know how, ma how much in terms of resources is required. And do they have a designated member of a staff whose job is to run the PV process? Okay, um, we have, we're lucky in Dundee that our team has expanded from two, our sustainability climate change team has expanded from two to five, uh, but actually it was um, two members of the team have been involved in this, um, along with uh, someone in community services, and um, it's not been full time for them, so I would say that, yes, with two, a team of two, you could definitely deliver it. Right. Okay, brilliant. And we know that this is another key issue, isn't it? It's capacity building. And although the community empowerment agenda has gained a lot of momentum, especially since the Community Empowerment Act in 2015, we also know that for a lot of local authorities, community learning and development departments have been reduced over time. So there's that slightly contradictory sort of development. Um, I want to open it up. We're going to go into group discussion in a second, but I wonder, um, so it, and in the groups, what we're going to try to do is to mix a little bit more because we want our friends from Portugal to spread across the room so that then they can bring back to Valongo some of the uh, conversations. Uh, so we're going to ask you to mix a little bit and, uh, and that's a chance to react to things. So I'll hand over to David and Francesca for that part. But before we do that, if there are any questions that you want to ask of any of the speakers, we can spend a couple of minutes on that. Uh, and then the speakers we will also distribute them across the table. So I don't know how we're going to do it, but we'll trust in the power of self-organizing and we'll, we'll mix the groups. Any questions um, based on the presentations, any doubts or any comments that you would make in reaction to that? Yep. Um, you want to come to the front so we can hear you online? Yeah. You came all the way from Portugal, so you might, you might as well <laughs> come all the way from the chair to the, to the stage. Yeah, uh, thank you. My question is for the last presentation. Um, we work uh, here in, um, by the way, I'm Cesar, I'm from Portugal. Uh, I worked in a company which is called Wiremice in Scotland. We have been working here since tomorrow. So in the past, we have worked with several councils and uh, with platforms for online. Uh, and um, the PB. And uh, in the last presentation, I noticed the problem that is, I think you are still talking about internally, about uh, having people to uh, vote in 10 projects, which is awesome when you are in person and you have them for half an hour. And it's awful when you have online and you have them for 18 seconds. So that's the time that you have online, 18 seconds of attention. So um, my my question is, um, I, I know that that's one of the concerns. It's standard. It's not only yours. Okay. I know that in LEAF, we, ex we had, I think, two or three exercises here with our platform when we tested several things. The first one, they have to uh, make points to each one of the projects, and there were 50 of them. It's not, not good. Uh, so many complaints. I heard not, not any complaints till now, but um, they have complaints with that. The, the main thing is, what is the expectations? So in the last point, you ended up with KPIs. So that's your expectations. And I, my question is, what are the expectations? How would, be, how would it be a perfect process? So, okay. I know <laughs> it's sort of your tissue there. Sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll put that to the Northeast team. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to And of course, there will be, we have lunch coming after this. So I think a conversation 
my my follow as well there for the detail yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you Cesar I think we'll all have different answers to this and the great thing of building a partnership as you go along is that we are exploring all these questions as we go along however I'm interested to hear your kind of 18 seconds of attention online um both Money for Murray and TSI Murray have done uh, online voting before and because we are locally based and the projects are locally based we have not found an issue with the engagement. Um, I, I would say that we have done voting for multiple projects as a requirement so that uh, we take out any any barriers on any groups that it's it's got a sexier project or, or has got more members or more supporters. Um, we also have our colleagues at Money for Murray have invested the money that they've got to support this year's project. Uh, they've invested that in, in 10 or more tablets. Uh, that means they can actually engage with people on a face-to-face -face basis and help them to do, cast their votes. So, and we are doing a marketplace and various uh, place-based events during the voting period. So mm -hmm. we are providing a mix. And we're going to, I mean, the, the, the key performance indicator is how much can we learn in this year uh, to make it even better next year. But, but we're building on, on strong foundations and a very particip participative process in terms of people engaging uh, within the tight, tight time scales in the project, uh, in the process. So uh, we've got great hopes. That's Thank super you. helpful, Fabio. It, it does show the power of hybrid. Right, and it's, it's, it's very different to, to develop a hybrid public that you know where you mobilize people face to face, and then there's a digital dimension that just purely digital. So, I think that's a conversation you guys might want to follow on. Uh, if you want to come yeah. in briefly, yeah. because our, our friends online might be uh, leaving soon, so I want to say goodbye right. to them. So, one yeah. minute. Yeah. My, my question is now, me colleagues from this incredible partnership that you have showed us. It's also to, to you, I think, Tricia, there's one issue that we have observed and we continue observing is that the portion of the projects which are voted is incredibly low in relation to eligible projects and to the ideas which are not transformed necessarily into projects or which are not eligible because of the existing norms. Okay. i give you a couple of Lisbon. Over 10 years, it's about less than 10% of the 4,000 something projects which were voted. Okay. So the big questions that cities are, uh, are asking is what should we do with the rest? Because as part of the work, you know, we examined and I spent time on that, you know, looking at these projects, you know, those not voted. And I think this is the gold mine. Globally speaking, to, to, to face that. And um, this is big data. And you see how capitalism is concentrating on the big data, making profit out of it. But I think that from the democratic side, we should have a sort of big data bank of these incredible ideas. So my question is very simple. What are you doing? And some cities are doing differently, but what are you doing? with all those incredible ideas, more or less elaborated, coming from the people which are outside this other side of the coin, which is much bigger than the small coins of uh, the money which is being put there. So any solutions, any practice would be super welcome, you know. Great, thank you. So I'll... I'll... I'll let you decide who wants to take that one on, which is a challenge. It's a challenge we might take into the group discussions as well. Maybe, yeah. And, and there is, and as Fabio was speaking, so I want to ask online uh, whether in that hybrid approach that you take, how, how do you make sure that, that you're reaching out to underrepresented groups? So that's, mm -hmm. and that's the last question we'll take, and then we'll say goodbye to people online. <laughs> well, proper collaboration. <laughs> So I think we've had a great opportunity in terms of um, the Scottish Government's support and encouragement of setting up these um, regional climate action networks and hubs and funding supporting them, so like MESCAM. So our job is to be working across the board, not just with the winners, but the rest of them. And I loved hearing about Dundee's Ideas Bank. You know, uh, there's a lot of great ideas here today. And so we will be engaging with them, we encourage people to kind of join up and be 
key members to kind of access information sharing and uh, things that will really help them in develop their projects, their journeys, uh, their education awareness and how to how to do things. So I see that as one of the solutions um, in the northeast anyway, and, and I think Murray have got similar objectives as well. Yeah, so I would say that we've been doing TP for a number of years and yes, PP is about the money and even small funds, some community groups can do amazing stuff with a couple of hundred pounds, but it's not just about that. Uh, the, the point about big data, um, absolutely, uh, we've been meaning for the last seven, eight years now uh, to actually build on, on what's coming in, um, on kind of capturing really was it that matters to communities. Have we done it in a systemic, systematic way? No, we haven't. Uh, can somebody help? If you can, please get in touch because absolutely we'd, like, we'd love to have a way of mining that. But for us, it's been about engaging with folks and building capacity. So coming in, th there are no losers in the process in that if your project is not funded, you have actually made links with others, sometimes in your community, sometimes in another community, sometimes at TSI Mari, sometimes at Money for Mari, whoever it is, it's about then developing that relationship so that you can, if you can't run that project that year, maybe you can do something else that, that takes you forward in the direction you want to. And lastly, just very quickly, we've got this um, Green PB opportunity, but there's also a partnership bid, which was mentioned as well in terms of the Just Transition Fund um, that ourselves and Money for Murray, University of Aberdeen, um, and many other partners are involved with in terms of delivering um, community assemblies and that kind of engagement and everything as well. A part of that is we want to work in um, outcome mapping so that, yes, we might have ideas of targets and KPIs, but also it's kind of, you know, what is coming up and out of communities rather than us just setting the agendas and the outcomes. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So if I think we have we have here the makings of a really strong response, which comes back to the theme that was highlighted by many people today, which is not just about PB as an island, but PB as part of a constellation of community networks, uh, inter-community networks, all kinds of civic spaces, existing infrastructure. And once you have that vibrant ecology of democratic practices, then even those who might not be successful in one round of PV can still be connected to other things happening. And there's that sense of collective purpose and opportunities that might come through those other networks and broader infrastructure. Um, so I just want to close for, for those online who have been there patiently. Hopefully you could hear us. I'm sure you can hear my shouty voice because it does come across. Um, I just want just a couple of reflections and, and then I'm going to hand over to, to David and, and Francesca. So it's very clear. I mean, it, it's clear that it is challenging, right? And it's challenging not just because it's a new approach. It really is a new way of doing democracy. It's part of an entire new paradigm. That's never going to be easy, right? Um, but it's very clear as well that the alliances that are being forged across sectors, the public sector, the third sector, the community sector, potentially the private sector, and also between activists on the outside of institutions and internal activists, people within institutions trying to carve up a space, those alliances are the key. That's how we go from a critical mass to a critical mass, and that's when change begins to happen. And then uh, the power and the promise of this agenda is that, uh, you know, if we manage to build an effect effective bridge between PB communities, and I mean communities of place, communities of practice, communities of purpose, and climate action communities, that can be one of the most powerful movements uh, in the climate action space. So I think uh, we are in the early stages of, of a potentially game-changing uh, uh, movement. Um, I just want to finish a reflection on something. I can't remember who said this. There is, you know, someone said, well, our PV process is not perfect. Um, you know, uh, democracy is messy, right? Uh, there is no perfect PV process in the same way that there is no perfect parliament, no perfect council chamber, no perfect democratic process of any kind. So we shouldn't apply impossible standards to these new civic institutions that have a lot of potential and that are going to help us to try and develop new forms of democratic life and economic life, hopefully, and in doing so, uh, help to address the climate crisis. So I, I just want to say goodbye to those online.